welcome into Fireball Friday as we discuss the performance from Sydney, who got it done over Melbourne by 22 points to kick off opening round last night. David King is the best analyst in football. He was there on the spot. Kingy, it's time for our Friday first thoughts. In fact, it's not our first thoughts. It's our review of last night's game for the Drain Man. Drain problems. Call the experts the Drain Man. What'd you make of it? I thought it was a cracking contest. It was uh, a little bit damp, a little bit uh, slippery for large portions of the game. So we didn't get to see the skill fest that we hoped that we'd see for night one. Um, but I guess when you come to Sydney, you've got to expect some wet, some wet weather type conditions. But the thing for the, the biggest take from the game for me is that Melbourne now have a problem with Max Gorn if he fatigues in the mm. second half. Mm. As, as, a, as an ongoing concern because I thought he was worked over brilliantly by Grundy and McLean, who I thought was significant, particularly in that second, third quarters, and they just took control in the second half. And I felt a lot then falls on Max's shoulders to, to, to consistently find. Physically, he was worked over. Every time he took a step, someone would bump into him that wasn't the opposing ruckman, uh, whether it be a wingman in, in, in McInerney or, or an on-baller in Heaney. Or, or, or even Blakey would do it on occasion. Robottom was constantly doing it. Every time Max took a couple of steps, they were physical. Now, we've seen this work before. Yep. Port Adelaide put this on the radar uh, 12 months ago. And Melbourne deny that this has an impact on Max. But you, you can't tell me in that second half last night when he had only two contested possessions in a half of football, the best ruckman in the competition wasn't impacted by being targeted. It was poor. Mac Max Gorn was poor last night. And if you play Melbourne this year and you are an opposition club and you do not use that same tactic, you're, you're negligent. Which brings me to, to sort of my, my point here. And teams have to be far more ruthless at the trade table and with players who you have under contract and with players who you are happy to let go if you need to. So... Melbourne have Brody Grundy under contract for four years, Kingy. They've got him for four years. You've got Max Gorn, who's 32 years of age, who's going to need some support. And in the trade period, Brody Grundy's not happy. So Melbourne go, oh, okay, he's not happy. Let's trade him to Sydney, who is going to be a rival of ours. They're both going to be fighting for top four. You didn't trade him to North Melbourne or West Coast. You traded him to Sydney for pick 46 and a second round pick. Now, pick 46 turned into pick 48 or something ridiculous at the draft. And that player probably doesn't play. And Sydney's second round pick at the end of this year, if they're pretty successful, is not going to be worth that much either. If Brody Grundy doesn't play last night, do Melbourne win that game of football? I don't know. But Melbourne have got a better chance with Gorn in that midfield if you're rucking against Peter Adams. Now, if you're telling me you're going to rely on Tom Fullerton and Josh Shackey to back up a 32-year-old Max Gorn this year... When you had a good, solid Ruckman under contract for four years and you've given him away for a bag of chips, that is a ridiculous list management decision. And at the time I said it, I said, you only trade Grundy if it is beneficial to the Melbourne Football Club. And what they've done, they've done Sydney a favour and potentially it's cost them one win already and your rival gets the jump on you because you've given Brody Grundy a good Ruckman to them who torched Max Gorn last night for a bag of chips. So, so this... It's a good discussion, right? So the whole of last year, everyone said that Max and Brody didn't work. Where did you sit on that? Well, it, it didn't work together, but you need two of them. You, you, you need two genuine. So runners. you're keeping Brody in 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 the in the selected twenty three or in the reserves? No, in the in the reserves until you need to rest Max Gorn, or you can play them both if you want to look after Gorn. If you get through the halfway point of the season and you're in a good position. There's no reason why you can't play two in the same side. It wasn't disastrous. Like, it wasn't, you look at it and it wasn't galling. It wasn't glaring that it wasn't working. But you've got an excellent backup Ruckman. Everyone needs two. We saw what happened to Port Adelaide last year. They didn't have any when Scott Lyson went down and it cost you in finals. You're going to need two at some point. It's why Essendon go and get Goldstein to, to team up with Draper. It's why West Coast go and get a, a Ruckman at the trade table. You need a couple of them. And Melbourne have gone, now we're going to go into the season with Tom Fullerton when we had Brody Grundy under contract for four years. I, I think it was a really silly move. The only way you would have traded him if it was significantly beneficial for the Melbourne Football Club, they got pick 46 and a second rounder. And Max Gorn's 32 and he's cooked already. We're one game in. Yeah, I, I think... More uh, ruthless. They need to be more ruthless. 
Well, do you want to keep a player on your list at that cost that you're really not going to play? Well, we're not we're not here to to play favours. He decided he's still getting paid. He's still getting great money for four years. And he is will, it a good spend for your footy club well, though? It, well, I mean, it, your salary cap does put some restrictions on you. You, you have to satisfy the list build, well, if you like, what if, if you've got a redundant down, position. What if he goes down? Like, what if? Well, and I, I know good, if Gorn goes down. It's a good discussion to have. What I'm saying. telling you now, if Gorn goes down, it doesn't matter who's taking over. They can't win it if well, Gorn goes well, down. They probably I don't care. Still I don't can. care who they got. No, nah, they probably still can if you've got... Can, like, can Sydney win it with Grundy? If they had Grundy, they can still win it. They can't win it if they got Josh Shackey. I'm telling you that. No, no, nothing stands out like an uncompetitive tool. I'm telling you, nothing, nothing, particularly... In those conditions, they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't, Melbourne, but from what I've seen in the last 12 months. The, the feedback on Grundy and Melbourne, it, it just swings violently. I, I, and, and the same people make different different um, discussions about it. I, I thought I thought that at the minimum what it did do last year, and Lee Montagna made this point time and time again, that at least it gave Max a softer first 18 weeks of the year. Well, that's that it. he didn't have to play 100% ruck time. Now, they may find that with Fulton... They've been unlucky with him getting injured uh, at the end of the year. But all, all I'm saying is now there's a there's a clear and obvious template that you've got to bash Max. If you don't bash Max, what are you doing? And, and if if you do bash Max and he tires like this, wow, that, mm. that's a that's alarm bells for their for their campaign in 24. Yeah, he he need. I mean, um, we've we've lauded Max Gorn for so long. Like he's got six All Australian blazers. He's going to be in the Hall of Fame and he's going to be a legend at the Melbourne Football Club. And he already is. But he needed to be tougher last night. He, he needed to insert himself into that game in those conditions, in that moment when you've got an experienced midfield of Oliver, Petrarca and Viney up against a bunch of kids. Like Warner's 22, Gordon's 21, Rowbottom's young. Uh, and that was the only way Melbourne were going to win that game of footy through dominance through the midfield. And in the second half, they were smashed. And a lot of that falls on the leaders of the Jeff. Melbourne Football Club. Now, they were a bit touchy when you said this last year, weren't they, Melbourne? They were, when yeah. you, When you said that they didn't help and support Max. Well, last year, I can, I can vividly recall that there was a boundary line contest between the young, tall forward of Port Adelaide, Ollie Lord. Yep. And he went after Max physically, and then he pushed him to the ground on the boundary in full view of all the teammates, and not one come to assist. And even if it's just for some, you know, a show of strength, a show of support, you have to roll up. You have to turn, they give away a free kick. You don't necessarily have to do anything like that. But the, I wouldn't mind the investment in a free kick every now and then, mm. just to send the message that it's not happening today. It, it, there, are, there are greater penalties, I think, if you, if you are inactive and let Max in isolation fight the fight against 22 competitors. I mean, that's just unfair on your captain. You've got you've got to support him. And, and you're right with Sydney. One man can change a contested possession profile. And it can be a ruckman, it can be a gun on ball or a clearance player. We saw Lockie Neal go to Brisbane, who were an awful clearance and contested possession team. Bang. One of the competition leaders. We saw Dangerfield go from Adelaide to Geelong. Change Geelong's contested profile immediately because of the, this, that's how they play. Grundy has now made Sydney a, a proactive first step you know, charging forward, breaking into space. He's made them a, a, a clearance team immediately. They're already they're already a great ball movement team. They've got kickers everywhere. Mm. And they were banged up last night. There's no Mills. There's no Parker. There's no Adams. They're going to be better. I'm telling you now, Sydney are real. Yeah. They led They led 17 games last year at three-quarter time and, and somehow lost six of them. Only converted that into 11 wins. They're a better team than what we're judging them on last year. And they're going to be better given Grundy and the growth in these young guys in 24. All right. We're reviewing last night's performance for drain relining is the no dig, no drama way to rehabilitate your assets. Go to the drain man. You can have, uh, have you say on that? And then, I mean, it's early and you, you really don't want to overreact to, to round one and, and Melbourne are going to win a lot of games of footy. There's no doubt about that. But the, the frustrations of Melbourne fans to see in the first half, you have 29 entries and kick two goals and we're going, oh, yeah. <laughs> It's the same issue again. And you go, okay, well, fans out there going, well, hang on, you've had five months. To, this is the one area you've got to work on. Did we see anything that suggested, and I understand tough conditions, understand personnel. Tough conditions. Personnel not yeah. ideal. No picket who's going to be really impactful and important. No petty. 
McAdam, uh, I'm not sure. May, may, he'll, he'll play the odd good, good game and, and kick you the odd three or four occasionally, maybe once or twice a year, but he's not going to be the answer. So I understand the reasons for that. But did they do anything with their ball movement? Because I, I saw it from Sydney. I mean, they're playing in the same conditions. Every time Goulden got it, he's looking inside. It. Campbell's the same. Blakey's taking it on. There's the little handball from Heaney to Blakey, just that little tiny handball that set up a Will Haywood goal with a fast entry. I just didn't see enough of that from Melbourne last night and the frustrations for a two-goal first half after the amount of entries they get is there again. You had him in your eight. Yep. Would you? Are you thinking about adjusting? I'm going to give you a mulligan. <laughs> Would you move them out of your eight on what you've seen? Because you... you it is very early. It's not, we haven't even hit round one. We're in round zero stage. No, they'll make the eight. They, 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 they'll make the eight. Yeah, I mean, they, they've gone up to Sydney, um, and they're really strong in the first half in some key areas. They were poor when it comes to connection again. But they're, they're going to be tough to beat, and they'll get some personnel back. I'm not panicking on Melbourne yet. Great to see Clayton back out there and getting 30 touches. I thought Viney was, was, was huge. huge. Salem's going to be an asset for him around the middle of the ground. McVie is a player we need to start talking about and recognising his impact more and more. Howes looked really comfortable, really comfortable at Harper. Yeah, hey, good. mate, got beaten a couple of times, made a few blues, but I thought he was terrific. Jake Bowie, to put his body on the line like that. I mean, sometimes you can you can lose the game and you can you can just leave things like that on the on the deck. That that was a moment that young man mm. undersized, he knew what was coming. To put himself in harm's way like that, I thought, you know what, that sets that sets the standard for Melbourne in that facet. Not that it's ever questioned at Melbourne, but when a young player, an undersized player does that, you say, Well, wow, what what a what a what a great place it is. So what happened last year? Within the gun, anyone I, who I put in the gun played really well the following week. So just, just for example, <laughs> if I put Jeremy Cameron in the gun, geez, Jeremy Cameron's been quiet for a couple of weeks. He needs a big performance. Bang, come out and kick six. Um, <laughs> so if you are in the gun, it's probably not a bad thing if you're in if you're in my gun. But uh, Kingy, I'll give you the new ball. Who's in the gun? I'll tell you who's in the gun. And it's a pair of players in the gun this week for me. I think the Gold Coast Suns have to pick Levi Casbolt. Because Ben King and Jack Lacocious <laughs> do not unconditionally compete in marking contests. The Suns, the Suns should have gone past Levi. They're a better team um, yep. on paper without Levi. Now you have to play him because he sends he sends a bit of a shudder through the opposition with his pack crashing capability. But let's be honest, if King did that and, and the other tall, uh, Jack Lacocious did that, if they had their foot, you know, their, their Ruckman doing that, they wouldn't need to play Levi. I, I think it's on those two guys to step up their competitiveness, King and Lacocious, to allow this team to select their best 23. I don't think that's unfair. And I don't think there's many people listening that would think that is not unfair either. I, I, you know, they've played some good football at times, but consistently, unconditionally, do they give the effort? And, and that's probably been um, the problem with a number of Gold Coast players. They've, they've been happy to coast, play the odd good game of football, but now it's time to go. And the club has put it on themselves to for that to be that time, and, and they're going to drive that. Jed Walter recovering from that collarbone injury. Looking forward to him coming back and seeing what the three of them can look like, and then he probably takes the Casbolt spot uh, in time. I'm putting the Giants in the gun, and I want to see if anyone gives Jordan Ngoi any level of respect. I'm not calling for tags or anything, but the last time Jordan Ngoi played against the Giants, he cost them single-handedly a spot in the grand final because you refused to go anywhere near him at stoppage. 34, 13 clearances, 17 contested possessions, and he continually went to stoppage, stood on his own, got the clearance, burst out and set Collingwood up. So I know they play a system. You've been there. They would have spoken to you about that. They play role. They play system. But that doesn't mean if Jordan Ngoi is standing all alone at stoppage, Tom Green, Canelio, someone, a half forward coming up to the stoppage cannot stand alongside Jordan Ngoi. So they're in the gun with the tactics. And I want to see how they go about that and if they learn anything from the prelim final. But, but you're comfortable with Tom Green standing next to Jordan Ngoi? Anyone. I want anyone. Just, yes. I'm, yeah. yeah, 100%. Tom Green yeah, goes, that's shoulder, what happened. goes shoulder to shoulder with Jordan Ngoi. But for goodness sake, don't let him stand on his own and be hit to and then go again. 
someone put no, some level of respect into him. That's a good call. And when, and when you lose a preliminary final by a point, all those little things uh, come home to roost, don't they? You, you're very impressed with both teams. This is going to be a cracking mm. game. The, the Pies have, have been a little bit dinged up back end of pre-season. Good to see uh, Dean get his, his first opportunity, Charlie Dean. I just feel like this, they're gettable without Murphy down there at yeah. the moment, without Howe down there at the moment. I, I really think the Giants' forward line could cause them some problems this weekend. Yeah, it's got it's got that feel about it. I, mm. I, I did tip Collingwood in this one. I thought they'd been a, a little bit disrespected and start as underdogs coming off the premiership. But when you look at the back line, they're going to have to play smaller and, and Maynard and Crane will probably play a little bit taller. That's that's the issue. No no Finn McRae as well. I mean, everyone at Collingwood's been telling me how good he's been going, but he can't get a game. Would Is that a concern at all or not? Uh, no, not a concern. I mean, they're pretty stacked in the middle, aren't they? Mm. I mean, you got who you got in the middle? You got Crisp. You got Degowie, Dacos, Dacos Pendlebury. Well, if Pendlebury didn't get up, he's probably in. But that's just a lot of trying to break into a team that's just won the flag, isn't it? Mm. You, you've just got to embrace that that challenge. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Harvey Thomas from the for the Giants, a, a small forward, just get an opportunity this week. This is a great time of year when someone's worked so hard through a preseason period. Uh, to get an opportunity in, in a in a star-studded lineup, so you, good good luck to the young guys making their their debuts this week. All right, a lot of texts coming through. Keep them coming through. If you've got someone in the gun, let us know. Mark's got someone in the gun. It's the non-controlling umpire. This is why most fans don't like four umpires. For the most part, they need to stay out of it. I thought I was watching a 2016 Grand Final Mark II. I felt Melbourne was being kept in the game by the umps in the first half. Says Mark in Sydney, David and Kane. David and Kane, very formal. Oh, when, we're in trouble. When it comes to trouble the Melbourne's yes, forward this? line issues, the issue <laughs> is, sorry, is the issue, A, Melbourne just bombing it in, B, the forwards aren't leading and moving enough. Well, I, I would think it is a combination of both. I think they're too slow to move the ball in there. It's too straight line. They don't move the ball off the line enough, and they don't run to receive with a handball to get the ball in there a little bit quicker. And, yeah, their forwards can be stagnant at times. Put on the agenda. I think the the AFL have finally caught up with what the community, in my opinion, have been likely to accept for a long time regardless regarding the uh, head high issue, the head high contact issue and, and the, the concussion discussion. I haven't heard many people whinging about seven weeks. I haven't many, heard many complaining that it's it's – Grossly over the top. It might be. It might be a week too many. It might be. It might be two weeks too many. But it's not. It's not like four weeks out of whack. And I think for the first time they've drawn a line in the sand in a meaningful way. Yeah. The only, do you think now? The only do you thing think now that the be, players will adjust. Yeah. Oh, I, I hope. Yeah, you would think so. You'd be silly not to. I mean, there's still going to be some incidents in the moment. Running at full speed, they're going to get it wrong. Mm. Players will get it wrong at times this year. The reason I was critical of it is that it was three last week and now it's gone to seven. So I'm not sure how last week, last year, sorry, how it can last double, year. more than double in the space of six months. Now maybe we so we're too lenient last year. Is seven too many? It was six for me, but are we going to argue about one week? Probably not. But last year they were far too lenient on a couple of them. My overarching concern is around the state of the game and the elements, and I wrote about this in the age yesterday, that we are potentially going to lose if we keep being paranoid about legal action in regards to head knocks. So that's fine. The Webster one, no worries. That sits in a different category. But when it comes to a rundown tackle from behind or a fair tackle but the player is dumped and lands on them and, and hurts themselves but the initial tackle was fair or a smother, or a spoil, or a high mark with a need. Of, that's where I start to get worried about where we're going to get to. And I just hope it doesn't yeah. end up like Gaelic football, flag football, or, or AFL nines. And won't be, it won't ever uh, be flag football. Oh, that's, that's ridiculous. Well, you didn't write that, did you? No, you didn't I, write that. I, Please I, tell me you didn't no, write I, 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 I did in terms of what, where is it going to get to in 10 years' time? Because uh, for a long time there, a tackle was fair, a bump was fair, a smother was fair. So now there's no no bumping. There's going to be no tackling shortly and, and coaches will start. There's not going to be There no will tackling. be kingy. There, there's if, not. If you that's, watch the AFLW and, and Brittany Gutnick laid one of the fairest tackles you have ever seen 
and she was sent straight to the tribunal. The AFL wanted three weeks. Now, she got let off, but the AFL said, look, essentially we're not happy with this and we may look at changing rules to protect players. I'm like, how could you ever look at that tackle, which is a fair around-the-waist tackle, and yes, there was force that drove the opponent to the ground. How could you look at that and go, you, we're not going to have an issue with tackling? You, you couldn't. Well, I think what you've got to do, you've got to start by saying we're having 70 players concussed a year. Mm. So can we get that to 50? Can we get that to 40? Can we get that to 30? We may you have to take... can't get it to zero. Comp- You'll never get it to zero because it's a contact sport. And we accept there are some areas that are just a risk that, that are inherent with our game and we have to we have to accept. But you're just trying to mitigate as much as you can, aren't you? I mean, that the second part of this discussion, if the AFL asks for eight weeks... How do we not end up at eight weeks? How do we end up at seven weeks? Because it has to be an independent body that comes down with the decision. Otherwise, Maynard gets So where have they been? Three. Where, where, where have they been? The AFL. It, it, we, yeah, well, no, the, the, independent the independent body. Independent, what, are yeah, they yeah. Been, what, what are they looking at? What are they looking at that the AFL is not looking at? So all the advice has told the AFL, to this, to this point, we, it's an eight-week offence. We're coming in, we want eight weeks for this because the level of intent was high, although it was called careless or just, Still never understand that. It's the absolute template for what you can't do. We think it's an eight-week offence. Oh, no, we think it's seven. Mm. I don't understand that. But the, the AFL, this AFLW tackle, which go, go and look it up. If you're a football fan and you love the game, the AFL wanted three for that. And thank goodness the tribunal have gone, no, there's no, there's no way we can give this uh, player three weeks for that. So uh, you have to have an independent body. Otherwise, the AFL will just suspend everyone. That, that's my point. They're paranoid about this, and I get it. I understand it's a difficult position to be in, but to your point, we have to accept some level of risk. We all put our hands up to play. The game is really safe. It's never been safer, and they've done a good job. But at some point, you're going to cut, and you're going to cut too deep, and we're going to start to lose some of the elements, like a fair tackle, in the game that we love. But you're so not... You're the, the, bit, the point you said, right, the game's never been safer. That, 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 that's true, right, yeah. to a point. But we are paying now for the sins of the past. So when you're saying that unsafe period for the last 20 years, mm. right, and you're just accepting that, oh, we never had but a problem we did, there. But we we have, are having the problem. Yeah, but we didn't have that but information. But we are now... But, but this is my point. So did we actually have a safe code? Well, we, we didn't know. I remember having discussions with doctors about concussion. But we didn't have a safe code. No, because we didn't, have the, we didn't have the information. It's like, it's like, yeah. seat, it's like seat belts back in, I don't know, whenever they, before they came in. We, yeah. we finally found out that this is going to stop a lot of carnage. So you put a seat belt mm. in. So, but we didn't have that information before. I'm sure they would have loved to have had seat belts 200 or 100 years ago when cars first came in. But we didn't have cars that information. They were going 15k an hour back then. Yeah. It was almost impossible to hurt yourself. But, but look, I just think the game has caught up with itself now. Finally, I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm, I'm thrilled that we're taking this seriously and, and the community's on board. There's one item left on the Friday agenda. What do you make of the talk around Clarkson at a potential suspension? Oh, I don't believe in the suspension. I think he'll be fined, and I think that's about right. I think most rational people are accepting that as, as, a, as a likely outcome. Has he uh, made errors in the past? Absolutely he has. I don't think it's worthy of a suspension. I don't think we'll go down that path with our coaches, do you? No. No, I wasn't, I wasn't one for a suspension. Um, it was one word that he, that he chose, which was a, a strange word to use in that moment, heat of the moment. If he had said such and such head instead of such and such, you know, what he did say, then we're not even having this discussion. So I, I get that the language is important and his past history also has to be factored in and the AFL would hate the look of it. But he's backing up his players after a pretty nasty incident. So... Uh, Give him a fine um, and, yeah. and move on. I, I wasn't so, hot under the collar over this one. So take the word out of it for yeah. a moment. Just, just, let's just say that word wasn't used. And, 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 and he still fronted a player at quarter time. Is, is he still facing a sanction? Well, he was, he was a fair way away. So I got, mm. I got no issue with him shouting at a player from 10 metres away. If he'd gone over into the face of him or if he'd done what Brad Scott did to you, and came and <laughs> tried to charge you from behind. Yep, then we got an issue. But if he says, "Hey, Dougal, 
You're such and such. Like, no, it doesn't really bother me. The AFL wouldn't want that because you know, it does open up a door to, to other issues. But they would understand in the heat of the moment, very rare to have an incident like that on field. And if he shouts a couple of words across to the next huddle from 10 metres away, well, I think we can understand he's backing up his player. Well, I think that you've got to you've got to make a stand there and just make this a, a blanket rule. If if a coach talks to an opposition player at a break in the game, it's five grand. Okay. If you if you if first offence, second offence, it doubles. Third offence, it doubles again, and and stamp it out of the game because if you if you know you it's just a no go zone, you won't have any of these these issues going forward. Mm. Yeah, I you mean, agree with that? it's easier. Yeah, no, I've got no issue with that. But it's easier said than done when one of your players has been concussed for the third time in 12 months and you get line of sight of the guy that did it. So yeah, it's very rare that there's going to be an incident like that now. So, yeah, I, it's fine. that's fine. If you talk to an opposition player five grand, no worries. I'd, I'd be happy with that. The, the sell internally at the Kangaroos would be pretty easy, wouldn't it? Hey, it's, I'm taking a big personal whack here for supporting... Mm. Our own. Yeah, I haven't heard he's... one North Melbourne fan that's upset that Clarkson was backing up his player. Mate, it's been like four points to yeah, something. They, they love it. They, they, it's been they, like a victory. They love, they they love it. 